My name is Luke. Myself and my friend Robbie have been playing a lot of Dwarf Fortress um, recently and thought that we should try and turn that into some form of research output. Um, so we hope to contribute to uh, the discussion today a, um, an investigation of what we see as the key um, issue in thinking about ethics between, kind of stuck between the coding of ethics or moral codes um, and what players do with them. Um, so briefly I'll kind of be discussing these two kind of approaches that we've seen today. We've seen people talking about how do we make games ethical and also like how do we make players ethical, how do we reform players, how do we uh, give opportunities for players to bring their ethical frameworks to bear on the games. Um, and then we'll kind of uh, explore that nexus by talking about Dwarf Fortress, um, Prison Architect and some games by Mole Industria, um, which we'll get to. Um, and one of our guiding uh, lights, I guess, um, in thinking through these issues um, is the work of Gilles Deleuze, who um, talk, describes ethics as a typology of imminent modes of existence, what we do in situations, um, rather than kind of adhering to tr transcendent values. Um, and not being a, uh, a kind of a moral philosopher or a moral psychologist myself, um, I'm happy to like, learn from um, all the colleagues around here um, whose opinions may well differ, but this kind of tension between uh, kind of laws on the one hand and practices on the other I think is quite, um, is quite useful for thinking through what happens when we try and be good in games or we try and make people good with games or we try and make good games. Um, so thinking through I guess from a design perspective, um, thinking about moral laws in relation to code, um, there's a bunch of people doing work in this area. Um, Greg Lostovka um, describes code as physics um, in the sense that you know, I, can, uh, I might be able to break the uh, international humanitarian law, I can't break you know, the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and so that kind of provides a, a background to his thinking around law. Likewise, um, Alex Galloway, sees code as horizons of possibility. They um, completely frame what is possible uh, for players to do. Um, you know, we, uh, even choosing to do nothing in Walking Dead uh, is making a choice that the game is ready and waiting for you to make. Um, and from a somewhat different perspective, you know, uh, Roland Barthes reminds us that uh, language is legislation. And I guess with all of the, the caveats that um, that go with our thinking through legislation itself and whether um, you know, language and code is a, is a real kind of structuring device on the way that we think, the way that we are allowed to think in games, or whether like legislation it is available to be broken free from or whether it is kind of merely uh, in the words of, um, uh, is it Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean who says that they're more like guidelines? Um, you know, that's kind of a space to be explored and discussed. Um, from the kind of the player perspective, uh, kind of ethics, you know, as, as we've seen, emerges as, sorry, uh, things we do in play, uh, opportunities to build our sense of identity, to see ourselves represented. These are all really important kind of ethical drives when it comes to play. Um, we've had the mention before of uh, kind of pacifism as a kind of a hard mode in games and uh, players taking a real sense of pride in being able to complete an otherwise fairly violent game merely through uh, judicious use of sneaking around. Um, and Mia Cancelo has done a bunch of work on how people understand cheating from an ethical perspective. Um, and I guess one of the things that is important for a lot of the games that I'm talking about, particularly um, Dwarf Fortress, is, the, is an understanding of kind of challenge or difficulty, which is fairly hard to measure, uh, and achievements, which kind of are very, very explicit. And I think one of the interesting things about, um, to return to the Telltale games, is the way that uh, in The Wolf Among Us, there are achievements for both being a nice guy and being a bit of a, bar a badass. And so that kind of encourages players to play through both. And I wonder how useful the statistics are given that you kind of have players already kind of interested in kind of in playing through both frames. Um, but also when you've got explicit um, motivations, however small, to do that. Okay, so as I said, is that kind of area where the design side coding of moral possibilities and the, um, the kind of the player's application of um, their own modes of existence um, combined that we're interested in. Um, and the games we're going to talk about are the three up there. And most of you are cited, so you can read them. OK, um, Dwarf Fortress. Anyone played Dwarf Fortress? Played for Dwarf Fortress? We've got a few hands up in the air. Fantastic. 
Um, we've got a half a hand over there. Fantas well, half a hand is very apposite because Dwarf Fortress is a highly complex simulation game. Um, although it looks like someone is playing around with a typewriter, um, there's a remarkable degree of detail that this game goes into in terms of simulating uh, combat, emotions, uh, taste preferences. This is like SimCity if you had to read sort of a thousand pages every time you took an action. There's so much textual detail in this game. Uh, when you're having a fight, you're able to read reports and reports and reports about how a dwarf might lose half a hand, how about how uh, a floating rib might be broken, um, uh, you know, might, something might explode into a puddle of gore. This is all kind of effectively random number generator um, producing uh, story text that you interact um, at, with as a game. Um, so on the one hand, it's got a very, very rich simulated world. And on the other hand, you're interacting through a very, very crude interface. That's about all I need to say um, about Dwarf Fortress 4, kind of the uninitiated. Um, this is a game that's very, very difficult. Um, and the game invites the player to change their perspective on it. And it's the perspective that the game invites that the, the kind of the front page comes from. Losing is finally something of a motto for the game's designers, for its players. Um, and the idea is that it encourages players to enjoy the process of losing, of being beaten terribly by all of the kind of random uh, animals or beasts that will be thrown at you by the game. And because this is a very, very difficult, difficult game, um, fan communities have uh, propped up to take, to learn how to help each other through uh, dealing with this difficulty. Um, and some of that is through uh, sharing and wikis and kind of how-to guides, and we're all familiar, we're, you know, kind of familiar with those. Um, also because of the way the game is programmed, uh, you're actually able to go through and edit um, the, the game's code just by editing text. And the example I've got up the top there um, basically means that any uh, child that's born in your colony, which, which happens because dwarves will be dwarves, um, you can change the, their code to have to wait 12 years before they can be told what to do. Um, which, you know, some of your parents, you might have different ideas about how old a child has to be before you can tell it what to do. Um, but you're kind of able to physically manipulate the game with the code to allow you to take different perspectives. Um, likewise, the Dwarven Atom Smasher is a device, just it's, it's a simple drawbridge, but it has the ability to um, remove items from the game. Now, this is a game that's very, very rich in terms of its simulation, as I've mentioned, but the problem is that, that level of detail can start to become a problem for your computer, actually handling that degree of simulation. Um, <coughs> Socks are kind of a famous thing that tend to pile up in your fortress because all these dwarves are chucking away socks. Um, and your computer is keeping track of where those socks are, who's owned them, how degraded they are, and it becomes a bit of a burden for your, for your computer to actually think about. So if you stick them under a drawbridge, drop the drawbridge, it will obliterate from the, from the game. It's also helpful for dealing with enemies that um, might otherwise be um, very difficult to defeat. Okay, so I guess the, the point there is looking at um, there's the player practices around making a difficult game easier. Um, some of those practices are to do with code and actually affecting the rules of the game that you encounter. Um, and then others are kind of more about uh, changing, I guess, your desire rather than trying to beat the game or wondering how to win, uh, rather kind of embracing this, um, this suspension that you will lose sooner or later. And you, the idea is to enjoy that process. Um, Prison Architect is another game that uh, we find very interesting in terms of exploring the, the ethics of gaming, if you like. Um, it, I, you could joke, well, um, I, I will jokingly say that it's Prison Architect, it's SimCity if it were designed by Michel Foucault. Um, but the problem is, is that it's not really that at all. Like you see the name Prison Architect, you think, fantastic, we're going to get a really critical take. There's going to be quotes from uh, Discipline to Punish. Uh, you know, we're going to see some guys get around and shank each other. Um, and we're going to take a laugh at the, the perils of incarceration and simulating incarceration in a game. Um, the problem is, is that the game kind of forecloses any idea of justice right at the outset. And so you're left with merely the goal of running and managing the fortress without any uh, kind of moral justification or reason for doing so. Um, you know, you're just told to follow orders if you like. Um, the, the kind of the ethical uh, 
ethical concerns of the game spring outside of the text itself as well. Um, if you have a bit of cash to burn, you can put your text into uh, a textual description of yourself or someone you like or dislike into the game um, and even put your face into the, the game to so that a little, a little part of your prison or someone else's prison um, can have a bit of you in it. And so um, there's a kind of an ethical engagement of encouraging players to get invested in the game. And this is a game that's still in alpha testing. You can pay $30 to, to buy it and play a game that isn't finished. Um, and the, the designers are in the process of engaging with player feedback. So there's a kind of an ethical imperative there to kind of uh, build the game to suit the desires of the players and the ability to customise the game uh, kind of ties into that. However, um, this is a men's prison and you can customise your character as long as you're a man. Um, and so, um, you know, this player, Sarah Griffiths, has kind of taken issue with the fact that her... She has no ability to represent herself in this prison. Um, and so she's, um, I'll just read that out to you. She had originally requested to be transferred to a women's prison. However, her request was denied. Accepting her fate, she glued on a beard in order to fit in with her male inmates. Um, so while we're building games and offering abilities to kind of customize and to represent ourselves, we need to be really careful uh, of what our blind spots are. And you know, this, it's like the Model T Ford, right? You can have any gender you want as long as it's male in, in Prison Architect. Um, and maybe it's because you know, in this game, women are really hard to render. Um, they require a lot of extra graphics processing power. Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, the third game that we're going to talk about, um, however briefly, is uh, Phone Story. Now, this is a game that came out in late 2011. And it's effectively a Mario game and watch style situation, except it's playing you through the production history of a device, and it could be an Apple device, it could be a Samsung, they're basically um, more or less identical at this point. However, um, this is a game that kind of has that very, very explicit um, teaching that it wants to convey to you through your play. And I think that's where some of, the, some of this um, tension that we're trying to discuss here is, is lost because the game effectively wants you to realize that you're a horrible person for owning an iPhone and you know, donate your iPhone to someone else and just live happily um, without contributing to the kind of accelerated cycle of consumption. Um, and the, the gameplay itself is very, very closed. Um, it operates effectively on a success or fail basis. If you are able to uh, successfully nudge the child workers so that they mine the coltan, uh, you're then able to move to Foxconn and help workers um, uh, not uh, suicide. Um, then you might be able to help the Apple Store employees, uh, employees meet the substantial demand for these devices by flinging uh, iPads or uh, Galaxy tabs um, at kind of approaching consumers. Uh, lastly, you're kind of having to deal with the afterlife of uh, digital devices and there's plenty of literature on, um, on that. But this is a game that will keep going as long as you do and as soon as you fail, we'll say, oh, game over. Um, would you like to try again? And there's not really any ability to kind of engage with that game or change the game or, or um, kind of have any kind of conversation with the game, really. So to kind of sum up, that's, that's kind of the, um, the area that we're thinking through in relation to ethics, games, and play. Um, thinking about whether, uh, whether we're thinking about the players on the one hand and what they bring to the game, what they're trying to do in the game. Uh, what their motivations are, um, what, what they learn, um, or what the code does in terms of framing. What is a good action to take um, in this situation? And I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing this war of mine to, to kind of explore some of that tension. Um, likewise, when we're thinking about uh, you know, ethics, war, and games, is that kind of being a quote-unquote good person? Is it buying fair trade? Uh, or is it kind of managing to get your way through um, you know, a really complex situation. Um, you know, is it following the law? Um, you know, what, what do we mean when we mean ethics? Um, and lastly, uh, in terms of relationship between players and games, is that an open relationship or a closed one? And I think that uh, Phone Story is, is kind of, it's a closed critique of a closed system. Like, I don't know how this thing works. Um, but also the game of Phone Story doesn't really give me any opportunity to find out um, how the game might be played differently. It kind of addresses a problem, com um, complains about it, and then takes it from there. 
Whereas on the other hand, I mean, Dwarf Fortress is like a ridiculously, that's time, um, it's a ridiculously complex world and it's very, very hard to get into, but more or less anything you want to do in there you can do, or you can change the rules so that you can do. Um, so that's kind of why we were talking about losing is fun, because we were hoping to think through ethics not as, uh, not as kind of winning, but rather as kind of, um, you know, going down swinging, maybe you're on fire, uh, maybe your fortress is being overrun, um, but hopefully you're enjoying yourself and helping others to enjoy themselves in that process of losing. Um, so I'll finish it there.